Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. All right, give me the sit, Rip. Well, uh, we just landed after almost 28 hours of travel. <laughs> yeah, and then you started asking stupid questions. Okay, okay. Uh, you know what? Screw you both. I'm going to the bathroom. Look at gosh darn it. Why does this thing have nine dials when there are only two channels? Oh, and uh, I think I'll have the sausage pizza. Extra large, please, and a diet Pepsi. Tom, what, Tom, what do you want? Shh, hang on, hang on. I'm trying to get this CV scanner to work. I'm trying to listen to police chatter. What's uh, what's the phonetic for the letter T? Tango. And cash, or will that be credit? Credit. Here, use his card. What the hell, guys? You didn't wait for me. Uh, well, you were in there for an hour, and we were hungry. Oh, well, I uh. I fell asleep. A 28 hour flight and all that. Yeah, we could hear you. Oh, wait, wait, hang on, guys, 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 hang on. I think I found something. Great, where? Okay, um, hang on, I'm listening. Channel, channel. Okay, Beverly Hills. Cop! Two of them, right over there. They seem to be beelining for us. Hey, yo, 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 yo! Yo! You guys, Tom and Josh. Yeah? Yeah, yeah you, you, you under arrest. What? Why? Yo, we, we got this warrant, and here it tells me that uh, Dan, Tom and Josh have a warrant for their arrest. So, what, we're going to jail? Who are you again? I'm Dan. Nah, you cool, it's just Josh and Tom. All right, you two. Wait, but but you said Dan was on the warrant. What? <laughs> no, no, it, you gotta look here. It says Dan, Tom and Josh have the warrant. Wait a minute, your name wouldn't happen to be Dan, would it? Oh, yeah, I would. My name's Dan Danny Danielson. Mm-hmm. And the warrant says to arrest Tom and Josh. Yeah! It's right here, after the comma. Can we take a look at this warrant? I mean, legally, you have to show us the warrant, so can we take a look at it, please? Hey, 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 yo, Dan, do we have to do that? I mean, is, I mean, do we have to give them the warrant? I mean... I think they said something about that in the academy. I don't know. I'm not used to L.A. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. This is California. Which oh, yeah. Going? Okay, yeah, 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 sure. Oh, 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 no, officer, officer. I see what's going on here. This is a misunderstanding. Um, so, it, look, there's a typo on here. Uh, you see, you see here... This right here, the date says 6-7-2021. We were in Antarctica when this was issued. Since that's Europe, the day and month are backward. So it's actually 7-6-2021. You have to arrest us on July 6th. Huh. How about that? Damn time zones. You know, that's a first for me, Tommy. But whatever, you know, it says so right there on the warrant. I suppose we'll see you two in a couple of weeks. Hey, you too. You, you too. You'd better stay out of trouble. Don't you move. We'll be back. <laughs> oh, can you believe that, Danny? Oh, hey, hey. Yes. Don't ever see that happen. That. Wait. That worked. Uh, I, I, I guess so. This won't come back to bite us in the ass later, will it? Josh, when has any of our mad schemes ever come back to bite us in the ass? Okay, guys, well, we're running late now. We really need to get to Foley Recording Studio, so we should head out now before we hit rush. Hour! What? I wanted to do it this time. <sighs> yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Gentlemen, we are on an adventure. First, we're going to flood the city with blue. Chadwick Boseman and 21 Bridges. Then it's going to get chilly with Keith Davey and The Thing. But then after that, we buddy up with Kurt Russell. Welcome to America! And Tango and Cash. Here's where it gets different. When we take Sylvester Stallone and Nighthawks. And then when we try to figure out who's who. So please pay attention. With Rutger Howard and Blade Runner. And then put on your hats as we take Harrison Ford to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hike up those boots and crack those whips because the fire pit is swinging into adventure. Follow Dan, Tom, and Josh as they race the skies 
and follow the dotted lines to the X that marks the spot of this journey. Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's danger. It's deception. But hopefully there won't be any snakes. Every Tuesday, here at the Fire Pit. Gentlemen, I hope we live to tell the tale. Hello, bots and listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the Fire Pit. I'm Dan, or, or am, am I? Am, am. Nigel, and we welcome you back to another exciting episode. After closing all the bridges and tunnels in Manhattan and barely escaping the cold of Antarctica, we're back in sunny LA for tonight's film. As per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. Now to tell us about who we're watching and what we're watching, I'll send things over to Tom. Thank you, Dan. Tom. (laughs) Thompson here. And last week we watched... Keith David and Kurt Russell use the cleansing power of fire to take out an alien monster in 1982's The Thing. Tonight, Kurt Russell trades a flamethrower for a sidearm in 1989's Tango and Cash, a buddy cop romp that will hopefully be a nice refresher after the dark and heavy and cold film that was the thing. But to give us more of a rundown on the film and a look at the box office, I hand the mic over to Reginald. Why, thank you, Thompson. I'm Josh. Or Or are are they? they? Reginald. And as mentioned, tonight we are watching 1989's Tango and Cash, starring Kurt Russell, Sylvester Stallone, Miss Terry Hatcher of Lois and Superman fame, and Jack Palance. I probably mispronounced that. Palance. Like I said, Jack Palance. (laughs) It was released December 22nd, 1989. Had a running time of 104 minutes and a budget of $54 million with a box office return of $120 million. Has a Rotten Tomato score of 30%, audience score of 55%, with an IMDb score of 6.4 out of 10. Wow. So you know what that means, guys. You know what that means. We're in for a fun picture tonight. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you say fun with some very broad air quotes. Yes, because we typically don't have a lot of uh, success with movies that are around a six on IMDb. No, not normally. No, no. no and no. and um, is this we might have to go back through some of the history, but I think this might be one of our highest box office films to have such a low Rotten Tomato score. Well, that's the critic score, I believe. I think the audience score is a yeah, little it, bit higher. 55. The audience score was yeah. 55. So not much higher. No, yeah. I didn't say it was like, you know, that much of a difference, but yeah. At least half the people that saw it thought it was okay. Yeah, but um, as far as the box office goes for this film, Tango and Cash premiered at number two in the box office. It pulled in $6.6 million its opening weekend. Um, at number one on the box office, do you guys care to take a whack at what was number one at the box office? When did it come out again? December 22nd, 1989. Uh, 1989, December. I'll give you a hint. Okay. The name Christmas is in the title of the number one movie. Oh. Is it National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation? It is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Ah, I knew it. I don't got this guess. Time. Na- National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh my God, you guys both got it. This is uh, a first. Oh, high five. <laughs> oh. But at number three of the box office was The War of the Roses, pulled in 5.5 million. And then Back to the Future Part 2, which pulled in $4 million. But that was on its fifth week of release. At number five was Always. Two of these movies I've never heard of. But uh, other notables at the box office was at number six was The Little Mermaid on its sixth week of release. By that point, it had pulled in $34 million. Uh, number seven was Steel Magnolias, who pulled in $2.5 million on its sixth week of release as well. And number 10 was Look Who's Talking on its 11th week of release, pulling in $1.5 million. All Dogs Go to Heaven at number 16, pulling in 716000 at number 20 was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on its 31st week of release, pulling in $176,000. 
Mm, still some movies that um, you could choose from in the box office. Mm. There was quite a few. Um, like Dead Poet Society was at number 39 on its uh, 30th, 30th week of release. Wow. So there's a lot of other films in there. Um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids at 29 on its 27th week of release. God, there's this... Back in the 80s was crazy because movies would be in the box office for a ridiculously long time. Yeah. Like, especially compared to today. Like, they're in the box office like pre-covid of course movies would be in the box office for a few months and then they would be out of the box office and then on streaming and rentals two or three months later so several months for a film like that wow yeah and even 89 still the home uh entertainment and market was getting bigger and bigger but it still wasn't uh like i guess 89 it would have been pretty well established well, well, didn't oh, we, yeah. when we watch when we watched die hard 2 wasn't that in the theaters for like nine ten weeks something like that something like, like that yeah 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 i mean nowadays it's like you have a month in the box office maybe two and then you're yeah. out you gotta That's move if you you're good yeah like indiana jones was still in 345 theaters i mean that's not a lot but still on its 31st week of release still in almost in 350 theaters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. look who's talking was on its 11th week that's almost was it three months and it's still in was still in over 1,300 theaters. Yeah, that wasn't a blockbuster either. That was just a, you know, baby who you could hear their thoughts. No, that was a big one because on that week, it had already pulled in 109 Yeah, that was a huge hit. Yeah, look, who look Who's Talking was a big hit. Yeah, but it's not like blockbuster when you think of like a Marvel film now or oh. a Die Hard. It's just a baby. <laughs> it's a film about a baby. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah, but I mean, that was still a pretty big epic movie for its day. I mean, in terms of box office scores. Mm-hmm. No, no kidding. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, on its final weekend of release, bar, or uh, which would have been uh, week of February 16th, the weekend of February 16th, Tango and Cash closed out at number 15th. Um, it made a $1 million, where it had made a total of, uh, at that point, $57 million. The number one movie that weekend was Driving Miss Daisy. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't even on its opening weekend. Like, I don't know, Box Office Bojo gives really odd numbers this uh, for this time frame. I don't know why. I had to actually go somewhere else to get the box office numbers for uh, Tango and Cash. Really? Huh. Yeah. Maybe it's that weird flux of, like, computers and... This was 89. It had already been fairly established. Yeah. But it, it, sometimes it gets a little weird when it comes into four-day weekends, because Tango and Cash premiered on a four-day weekend. Oh. The Christmas weekend. That makes so, sense. So like they, they like they like to mash the numbers in on those weekends together. So mm -hmm. it can cause kind of weird fluctuations and the way at least the way they report box office numbers. Uh kind of like how they did like the 2000s where they the weekend release but technically they released the films on Thursdays and then yeah. Wednesdays. Like uh midnight releases would start being calculated on Wednesday night. Yeah. So the it, it's not that the box office got better for the weekends. It's just they um they expanded the weekend. Oh my mm. god! Yeah, it's like well, I guess that's all I've got for the box office. And now for the hopefully under five minutes meta report, I'm gonna send things over to Tom. Well, thank you, Josh. Yes, yes, my fellow podcasters here have uh, kindly hinted, nay, begged that I um. Keep the meta a little short, just the important details. And I'm taking it under advisement. So let's start with the catering. So catering this one. Two hours later. And that's why he was considered the best grip. God damn it. Oh, man. my God. Jeez. I mean, even the assistant cable guys he had to mention. Yeah, I didn't want to know what a dolly grip was, but I do now. Now we'll know forever. Can you just get on to the main cast now, Tom? I'm just going to say it was an awful lot of information for a movie that's got a 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, this is a movie with a lot of story behind it. But I'm leaving that to you to tell us about, Dan. But for now, Tango and Cash. Tagline. Two of LA's top rival cops are going to have to work together, even if it kills them. Summary. Framed by their ruthless arch nemesis, a mismatched LAPD crime fighting duo has to put their differences aside to even the score with the evil kingpin who puts them behind bars once and for all. 
generally, guys, what we have here is a buddy cop bungle starring two of the biggest names of the time and produced by a pair of hit makers, but written by a dude with B-movie horror experience and not even that much and had more people in the director's chairs than people working the film. I'm just going to focus on the key players in this one. For production, we have John Peters and Peter Gruber, who produced a few films together, and not a lot of misses in their resumes. We've seen a few of their stuff before. Um, Inner Space being one of the films they produced, but they've also done Man of Steel and Wild Wild West. So not 100%, but they do tend to pick more wins than losses. Directing this film, however, is where it gets tricky. Um, on paper, this was uh, directed by Andrei Konchalovsky. Excuse me, Konchalovis and Andre. I apologize. <laughs> this last name is Russian. Um, he might have seemed like a good uh, choice to direct uh, if you squinted. He had a few Hollywood films at this time. The biggest one at this point was Runaway Train with John Voight and Eric Roberts. Uh, but the rest weren't that much to talk about. And everything else were a whole bunch of Russian films that I guarantee you nobody's heard of. Probably not even in Russia. It should be noted he was eventually replaced. He was replaced by Albert Magnoli at the end. And the reasons for that is trivia that Nigel will likely get into. And there's also some contention about who was really in charge of directing. But that's a story for another day because this film was also written by Randy Feldman. It made no sense to choose this dude. He was an action horror writer. Uh, the only films he'd ever written were Nowhere to Run with John claude Van Damme and Metro, which was a career downturn Eddie Murphy film. And the only film he'd done before this was Hell Night with Linda Blair. So not a lot to work with here behind the cameras but thank god we have quality people in front for our protagonists our stars we have sylvester stallone kurt russell and jack palance sylvester stallone and kurt russell both playing tango and cash respectively both at peak russell and stallone in their careers Stallone action performance. He was coming off of the Rambo series, um, Rambo 3, Rocky 4. He would eventually go on to do Demolition Man and Judge Dredd not long after this. But yeah, this was Stallone at his most Stallone. And Kurt Russell, yeah, he was just now starting to peak by this point. Uh, just before this film, he had uh, done Big Trouble in Little China and Overboard, but he would eventually go on to do Backdraft, Tombstone, and Stargate. So this one was just him riding the wave to the top. And as the villain, Yves Pere, we have Jack Palance, a stage and performance professional known for playing tough guys and villains in dramas and westerns since back in 1949. We probably know him best as Kirby from City Slickers. He also played Grissom in Batman, but films he had done before this, Shane, Sudden Fear, Cocaine Cowboys, and Hawk the Slayer. And if you've seen him, yeah, he pretty much just squinty-eyed angry guy. And he's really good at that. Unfortunately, their performances weren't really enough to win over the critics. Uh, this was derided as both illogical and predictable at the same time. That's uh, weird. The, I don't know how they did it, but they did it. The Chicago Tribune, in fact, wrote that this um, quote was a crafty foreigner's sly parody of the current state of American culture and was nominated for three Golden Raspberry Award Awards for Worst Actor, Sylvester Stallone, Worst Supporting Actress with Kurt Russell in drag, and <laughs> Worst Screenplay, and it couldn't even win those. Although it should be noted, it wasn't all bad. Um, in 2012, 
the Flophouse podcast dedicated their 100th episode to Tango and Cash, and it's actually been praised as one of their best episodes ever. Um, in fact, Slate later listed it as one of the 25 best podcast episodes ever. So a case of someone else's shit being used to fertilize someone else's flowers. But also, you're at 620, just FYI. I know I'm, I'm done. I've, I've hit everything there. So thank you for timing me, Josh. I promised. <laughs> but back to catering, because I really want to talk about that. Tom, you're at two hours, six minutes. Come on, dude. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I've given the basics of what went into make this film, but my God, was there a lot more that went on behind the scenes. So Dan, sock it to us with some of that trivia. Well, I mean, this movie does have a bit of trivia. It's kind of weird. Um, it, it's got a lot of trivia for a movie that that is not well known or well regarded and almost an afterthought as far as 80s buddy cop films go. But uh, yeah, a little bit of trivia. Um, actually, this movie was made in response to Kurt Russell, who was originally considered and offered the role of Martin Riggs in Lethal Weapon in 1987. But he turned it oh, down. Crap. Yeah, he was. he was. He was supposed to be Martin Riggs. In fact, it was his role. But he turned it down to go make Big Trouble in Little China because he was friends with John Carpenter and he just thought that that would be a better film. And I mean, they're, they're both good movies. They're just different good movies. So Lethal Weapon, obviously the role of Martin Riggs went on to Mel Gibson, which can be argued that that was Mel Gibson's star making role. Mad Max is the role that got him discovered, but I, I would say that definitely his star making role is Martin Riggs and Lethal Weapon. Agreed. Um, so, uh, so anyways, Mel Gibson gets the role of Martin Riggs. He goes on to make Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon is a huge hit in 1987. And Kurt Russell was not disappointed that he went to make Big Trouble because that was a that was a flop, but it ended up being a cult classic. But he was a little like what could have been. So uh, the he wanted to make this movie because he wanted to get on in on that buddy cop train uh, because like I said, once lethal weapon came out, a bunch more buddy cop movies were made and uh, that, that started to become like the genre of the late eighties, early nineties. And speaking of our people originally cast uh, somebody who was going to be on, uh, if we'd have gone with any of the other lists that we had presented earlier, Patrick Swayze was originally cast as cash. Uh, but, oh. but he dropped. Yeah. Yeah. He was supposed to be cash, but he dropped out to star in roadhouse. Hmm. So. Okay, <laughs> arguably a smarter career choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I just thought that was interesting that that Kurt. I didn't know until I looked this up that Kurt Russell was really supposed to be Martin Riggs. Like that was his role. He just and I mean they were in the um, like the not pre production but like the finalization of the script and all this other stuff stages of the movie before he's like, ah, I don't want to do it. And then they, they cast Mel Gibson there. That was their second choice to play Martin Riggs. So, I mean, not uh, a bad choice. It's not a bad choice. And like I said, that was definitely Mel Gibson's star making role movie. I'd love to get to someday. Lethal weapon. Oh yeah. We definitely would have to, but yeah. damn, mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Like I love hearing about these alternate castings, so to speak. Yeah. Well, we're actually, our destination film is going to, I'm, I'm going to talk about it more when we get to that, but that's got an alternate casting too. I mean, every, like there's a universe out there where Tom Selleck is Indiana Jones. Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. I'll talk about it when we get to Raiders of the Lost Ark. But there is a universe parallel to ours somewhere where I'm clean shaven because obviously I have a goatee in this universe and I am clean shaven in this universe. And we are we, our destination film is Indiana Jones in the Raiders of the Lost Ark starring Tom Selleck as Indiana Jones. So wait, so, real quick before you continue, did that continue? Does that mean this is an evil universe? <laughs> we, we crushed that kid's dream in Rudy, Tom. We are absolutely the evil universe. Yeah, we are definitely. Uh, yeah, we're definitely the, we're the, the bad guys. One. We're the bad guys. But just moving on, Tom mentioned the directorial woes of this film, uh, and uh, this is my, the meat of my trivia. A total of four different people directed this movie. Andre Konchalovsky. I hope I pronounced that right. If I didn't. He's a nobody, so I'm not going to bother. <laughs> but, like, who cares? Yeah, who cares? Um, he was fired three months uh, into filming by John Peters and Sylvester Stallone, who was an executive producer of the film. After the movie went over budget and over schedule, executive producer Peter McDonald, who was the second unit director, then took over directing the movie for some time. A year earlier, McDonald had to step in as the director for Stallone's previous Rambo 3 after the original director was fired again by Stallone. 
then Albert Magnoli was hired as the new director to finish the movie. But even after principal photography was finished, he caused two more weeks of further delays after he decided to reshoot some crucial parts of the film. And then Stallone was also directing the movie behind the scenes, something he was known for, especially in the late 80s. None of them had any control over the editing of the movie. Oh, my God. Not even <laughs> Stallone. Not even Stallone. None of them had control over editing. <laughs> Instead, yeah. <laughs> It's a wonder why this movie was a train wreck. Like this movie's so well irregard, not irregarded, but just not even thought of. Um, when you think of like, what are the best mo- buddy cop movies of the eighties? I'd never see this movie on any of those lists. Instead, Warner Brothers hired expert editor Stuart Baird to re-edit the movie after they expressed a strong dislike for the initial rough cut. Baird hired another editor, <laughs> Hubert Hubert de la Bolero, uh, Hubert de la foreign name to help out (laughs) when Warner brothers kept complaining on every different cut of the movie that was edited. Like they submitted cut after cut after cut and Warner brothers hated all of them. (laughs) Nice. Dear God. This almost caused the release date to be pushed back. And if it had been pushed back anymore, they would have lost millions of more dollars on the production of this film. So in the end, the movie was finally approved by theatrical release by Warner brothers. And it ended up being shipped to theaters only a week after its original release date as wet prints an industry term. That means the movie was just barely completed before its release date. Literally this movie was edited, approved and sent out to theaters within a week. Like, Oh my God. Major. Major Hollywood production starring two of the biggest names of the late 80s. And this is what they did. Like they couldn't get it fucking right. You might want to blow on that pie before you dig (laughs) in, guys. Wow. Yeah. So that's why this movie is probably a 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Also, I'm looking at IMDb. It's Hubert Boleri. It's, yeah, I think he's it's uh, Della Boleri. So okay. Della Boleri. Sorry, I yeah, don't mean I, to insult his name, but no, no, that's all right. I butchered the director's name, so that's a little redemption for myself. Yeah. Um, however, uh, with the exception of Jack Palance, the actors and actresses that are in this film were proud of it. They liked it, and Jack Palance thought the movie was okay. He was just disappointed that all the scenes that he had with Sylvester Stallone were most of the scenes I should say he had with Sylvester Stallone were cut. He really wanted to work with him, so. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he got to work with them. He just didn't get to be on screen with him. Yeah. So he was he was a little bummed out. But um, uh, September 2019, Sylvester Stallone revealed that he has a story written for a potential sequel uh, because he does want to work with Kurt Russell again. However, Kurt Russell, for some reason, has been hesitant to do the Expendables films. He was actually originally supposed to be Mr. Church in the Expendables movies, but he backed out at the last minute. Was, uh, Kurt Russell's character, what? or not Kurt Russell, that was uh, Bruce Willis. Yeah, character. Bruce Willis is Mr. Church, but um, that was supposed to be Kurt Russell. And, and Sylvester, him and Stallone are still really good friends. So they wanted to do uh, a movie together and they haven't been, and uh, I should say, it's not that Kurt Russell's hesitant to do the Expendables films. They're having a hard time making Expendables 4 for various reasons. But if we ever get to an Expendables film, I'll go into further detail as to why number four is having a hard time getting off the ground. Despite the three movies, despite their varying quality, the three movies have made a bunch of money. But when you have that many people in their 70s and 60s, you have to you know coordinate nap times. <laughs> um, so Right. Right. Yeah, pills, uh, you know, and plus, and everybody goes to bed at six o'clock. It's just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's hard to get Cracker Barrel to cater a movie production, you know. <laughs> We're never going to get them on this show. Cra- Cracker Barrel, <laughs> Cracker Barrel. That's OK. I don't eat there anyways. So. <laughs> yes, Cracker Barrel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Damn, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, and I think the last two bits of trivia I have, uh, there's a scene in the movie where uh, after Tango and Cash get out of prison or escape from the prison, Cash turns to Tango and asks if he stopped. Uh, I guess, I don't know. I've never seen the movie, but apparently he takes a while to get somewhere. And Cash asks Tango, to his Sylvester Stallone's character, if uh, he stopped for coffee and a Danish. And Tango retorts rather tersely, I hate Danish. And it's an in-joke referring to, at the time of production, Sylvester Stallone was going through a divorce with Danish actress Bridget Nielsen. She's famous for being Ivan Drago's woman in Rocky IV, and she's also Red Sonja in the Barbarian Red Sonja movies. So, 
Oh, <laughs> yeah, she was. She was. Oh, yeah, she was. And she's in the movie Cobra with Sylvester Stallone. They were married for a little while, but it didn't work out because they have wildly different personalities. Wasn't that the, also a big deal that she came back to do uh, Creed two because they're not on the best of terms? Yeah, they um they just recently patched things up. Like their divorce wasn't ugly ugly because they don't have kids together or anything like that but it was just she was at the in the 80s she was definitely a party girl and sylvester stallone is not he's actually a very private individual he doesn't do a lot of parties and a lot of uh hollywood scene stuff and she very much was and that yeah so do your homework before you get married kids anyways yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't get married in two weeks yeah do your due diligence anyways and then my last little bit of trivia this movie contains two actors who would later go on into the mcu uh, both Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell star in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, although they don't oh, share. I, yeah, but they right. don't. Yeah, they don't share the screen together in in Guardians Two, but they are both in Guardians of the Galaxy Two. Yeah. I didn't even put two and two together on that one. Yeah, that is totally right. Yep. Yeah, I remember Russell was um, Mongo the planet. Ego, but, ego, ego. Excuse me, different planets, different universes. Yeah, but I completely forgot Stallone was in there. He was for a bit. Yeah, yeah. he's he's <laughs> he's the leader of I can't remember his name, but he's the leader of the original Guardians of the Galaxy. The 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 group that Sylvester Stallone's friends or he was the leader of that included um uh Yondo Yondo yeah. Um, mm. and the other ones that's the original comics Guardians of the Galaxy. The Guardians of the Galaxy that are in the movie now are the uh second generation Guardians. So Anywho, if we ever get to Guardians 1 or 2, I'll explain more about that, the difference between the, the two teams and the comic books later. But yeah, the, that's all I got for trivia. Like I said, the meat of it was all those production problems. That was just too juicy of an apple to not bite into because that's that was I love when production was just what the fuck. <laughs> it's like four different directors, a mountain of producers and a boardroom full of execs barely got this movie out on time. And even then, it was just this cobble work of Frankenstein parts. Are, are the arms supposed to go on the head? I mean, did anyone vet this blueprint before they built it? <laughs> exactly. So now that I've discussed the trivia production woes and uh, the actors' um, personal lives. Sorry, Sylvester Stallone and Bridget Nielsen. Uh, going into this hot mess uh tom you're the one who's gonna have to go first on this what are your expectations going into this film well i kind of know what i'm getting into with this one it's been a few years since i've seen it i first saw it uh bits and pieces of it like my dad rented it um when i was a young tom and young tom thought it was pretty awesome i mean guns cops stallone car chases comedy that was over young tom's head i thought it was a great cartoon i don't tom had different opinions on it <laughs> uh <laughs> i see some it's got cheese appeal so it unlike past bad films uh flash gordon enough said this one i find at least entertaining I, when i saw it again but um, there was that whole uh, swift kick in the groin. Um, you know, when you watch a film that you liked as a kid and realize it's not as good as you remember. So I'm now looking forward or hoping to get a more even uh, perspective on this. Um, now that I know what I'm getting into, it's not the great film that Kid Tom thought it was. Uh, it's it's a McDonald's cheeseburger, but they did throw on some extra pickles. So at least it has that going on for it. And if I'm going to get a little meta, I'm going to love our watch session of this. I think we're going to get a lot of joy out of watching this movie together, team. Josh, what about you? Well, I think we all can agree that the 80s is the greatest decade ever. I mean, for movies, music, fashion. So if our destination I mean, films are yeah, if our destination films are anything to go by, that is definitely something we seem to agree yeah, on. I mean, <laughs> clearly the best people were born in the 80s, am I right, guys? Am I right? Yes. I mean, yeah, no offense to our other uh listeners who were born outside of the 80s. It's okay. We don't fault you for that. No one's perfect. Nobody's perfect, but we can agree that the 80s is fantastic. So needless to say, this movie being in, made in the 80s, starring an 80s uh, Sylvester Stallone and 80s Kurt Russell, I would have to say 
that the bar is very, very high for this film. I'm expecting nothing less than perfection out of this film because it is a film from the 80s. <laughs> and this is where I insert the clip from Josh watching <laughs> the movie. <laughs> No, all honesty, um, I'm not expecting much out of this movie. Um, yeah, I, I, the bar is fairly low for me. Um, if I come out of this entertained and I can put it on par with 21 Bridges, I'll be happy with my with my uh, um, enjoyment of 21 Bridges. I know you guys had slightly different opinions about that film, but if I can come out of this movie with the same um, enthusiasm I had about 21 Bridges, that would make it for me. Like I acknowledge 21 Bridges is a great film, but I enjoyed watching it the three times I saw it. So if I come out of this movie not wanting to watch it ever again, then it definitely did not meet expectations. But that's what I've got. Uh, Nigel, how about you? Uh, I'm expecting a great buddy cop film on the same par level as Lethal Weapon. Absolutely not. Um, (laughs) No, I'm honestly... I thought my dad really liked this movie. And then my mom asked me yesterday what movie we're watching tonight. And I said... Tango and Cash. And she goes, oh, that movie's stupid. And I was like, <laughs> but my mom's not a big fan of Stallone and she's not a big fan of action films. And I was like, no, you told me dad liked that movie. And she goes, no, your dad likes the other Stallone film. And I'm like, what other one? You're going to have to narrow it down. And then mom says, the one where he goes into the future and, and uh, no one can cuss and anything. I'm like, oh, Demolition Man. She goes, yeah, he loved that one. I'm like, oh, and she goes, yeah, he thought Tango and Cash was stupid. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> because because i'm thinking about that i'm like oh my dad and i's movie taste kind of lined up and i love demolition man and my dad liked demolition man and if he didn't like tango and cash uh, we may have yep there may be something else i have in common with my with my late father so i'm a little nervous but i mean i don't know it, I, I think I know what I'm going to get into. It's probably going to be a not a great film, maybe an entertaining film, but it'll probably be bad. <laughs> so, uh, and that's okay. Um, if we're being honest with ourselves, yeah, like yes. no one can argue the star power of Kurt Russell and Sylvester Stallone. There's no one that no one can argue those two, but they have made movies in varying quality throughout their careers. Not every movie's been Big Trouble in Little China, The Thing, and Escape from New York for Kurt Russell, and not every movie's been Rockies One, Two, and Rambo One for Sylvester Stallone. So it's going to be probably not a great film. I'm just hoping to at least be entertained for the next couple hours. I mean, in what way do you want to be entertained? Like fun time at the circus or fun time watch, watching a train wreck? Uh, 80s buddy cop entertained. Okay. Gunfights, explosions, maybe a stupid out of place gratuitous sex scene. Hopefully not between Sylvester Stallone and <laughs> Russell. Uh, <laughs> uh, a car, maybe a, a car chase. I don't know. Like just something like that. Just, just, you know entertain me for a couple of hours and we'll be okay. Even if I don't like the movie or think it's that great, as long as it's at least entertaining. So basically we're looking for um, more of, to relate to the podcast, we're looking for more of an Aquaman and less of a swashbuckler. Yeah. My mom who does not speak meme, but she knows some of them told me that Tango and cash is like that meme. And when she finally described it, I won't go into how mom described it, but it's basically mom. Can we have lethal weapon? We have lethal weapon at home. Lethal weapon at home <laughs> is tank. Okay, so <laughs> well, well, we know what your mom thinks about this film, and kind of what your dad thought about this film. Um, and I know what I kind of think of this film. I wonder if there's anyone else that has thoughts about this film. None whatsoever. Nope, nothing. Nobody. <laughs> nobody. Nobody had a thing to say about this film, one way or the other. Actually, right, that's cool. that's a lie. Um, so, uh, I may or may not have probably did forget that I had trivia this week cause it's been a very busy week, but, um, I did manage to put something together tonight. Um, we're going to play the same game. We always play with the IMDB trivia. I'm going to use only the titles of the, the trivia questions or I mean the, uh, the reviews Okay. and judging by the title, um, you guys need to guess one through 10, Whoever gets the closest without going over gets the point. If you get it right on the money, you get two. And I'm ready whenever you guys are. Um, I'm strapped in. Let's let's tango for some cash. All right. I'm going to let Josh go first, just to be different oh, tonight. Sweet. Wow. wow. My goodness. Who, 
Were we all replaced by things from the last episode? <laughs> yeah, no one is who oh. they seem. All right, Josh. DL Racer 2 says Stallone and Russell are fantastic. Exclamation point. Nine out of ten. Oh, I'm going to jump on the other side of this and I'm going to say three out of ten. Tom's right on the money. That's a three out of ten. Oh my no God. Oh shit. <laughs> wow. It's a three out of ten. Okay, Tom, ODD Bear says, I'd pay cash to see this tango. Oh, boy. Seven. Um, say it one more time. I'd pay cash to see this tango. Six. Tom, again, on the money. Seven no out of No freaking kidding! Wow. All right, Josh. Uh, oh, shoot, I almost read the same one twice. Okay, JD. Seven. <laughs> Okay. I'm not even going to read it, but I'm going to log your answer as seven. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. J.D. Sherburn says, Tango and Cash come together to stop a very smart crime board. Um, I've been going way higher than I should. I'm going to go four this time. It's probably good instincts here. I'm going to go eight. Tom's closest. It's a ten. Jesus That's Christ. a ten? Yep. Of course. It's like my instincts are just not on it tonight. <laughs> no. Wow. Okay. I think Tom wins. Uh, unless, well, no, Josh can get No, the, he's no. got five points. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, I mean, there's two more questions. Let's see if you can Damn, at least I, get something on yeah, the board. Yeah, let me get something on the board. Okay. All right. Just because Tom's already won, Josh, you can go first again. Yeah. Oh, no, just okay. Okay. Going. Fine. Tom. Okay, Tom. He's going to try to price his right me. I see what he's doing. Pre-drag reviews says, yeah, I'll never forget that time in the shower. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. This is a one star. Um, just to be that guy, I'm going to say it's a two star. Technically, Josh is closest because it's an eight star review. <laughs> wow, that was a... get, I just wanted to get something on the board. All right, so Josh is, <laughs> so Tom still wins, but Josh can't be shut out now. So, yes, <laughs> there we go. All right, <laughs> must have been a good time in the shower because out of the three of us, I'm the only one who hasn't, a, hasn't had a six point shutout. <laughs> okay, are you guys I'd like to avoid that? <laughs> yeah, um, are you guys. Do you guys want to hear the tiebreaker question? Well, there, there should that be still question one. Four. Yeah, that, there should be two more. Yeah, there should be one oh. more. Yeah, one more question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yes. Bobby Knuckles says, to, uh, Josh, Bobby Knuckles says, the most macho film ever made. Ten. Damn it. That was going to be mine. Um, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to say nine. Technically, Tom is closest. That's a three-star <laughs> review. <laughs> Well, I got on the board, so that counts. <laughs> and, and the tiebreaker, which goes to Josh, would be tape equals play, brain equals stop. One. Two. Tom is closest. It's a six. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. Damn it, Dan. You won last week, and you passed your shit uh, scoring to me. <laughs> I am not sorry about that. <laughs> so. Holy God. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we can expect some... We're going to at least expect some entertaining watch section out of this film. I don't know if we're expecting an entertaining film, but either way, Tom played the music. Welcome back to another crime-stopping episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and tango to your cash, Tom. We gotta work together. If we wanna take out Jack Palance, we'll never make it solo. But together we might stand a chance. But thank you for buddying up with us here at the fire pit. We're using all of our experience from Shawshank Redemption and the Green Mile to make our escape and clear our name so we can have a clear shot at Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. When the fire pit swings into adventure, there's no obstacle that can stand in our way. And speaking of obstacles, let's see how the team's investigation is going now that they've cleared the obstacles of police incompetence. Well, that was a load of crap. What? We got the next clue. Was it that or the $80 cover charge? Yes, that was dumb. 
Well, anywho, I guess now we are off to... Hey, you two! Hey, yeah, you are! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You guys are under arrest! Well, I suppose it couldn't last forever. Take us in, officer. What? what? No, you're supposed to be arresting me, too. Wait, yeah, you... Whoa, just... <laughs> oh, I didn't do anything! Stop resisting, then! Oh, oh God! Now, what was you saying again? Uh... No, nothing. <laughs> Those are your guys, officer. Take them away. No, he's one of us! Yeah, you're supposed to arrest him, too. <laughs> Never seen him before in my life, officer. What? Who are they? I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Uh, uh, okay. That's far enough. Oh, come on! You forgot the Oxford comma! It's supposed to be Dan, comma, Tom, comma, and Josh being arrested! You guys are- Oh, God! What? Oh, fuck! Ah. What was that? Can't hear you! I don't know, these guys seem to be practical jokesters. Yeah, everyone knows Antarctica's not in Europe, it's part of Australia. You dumbass, we know that's in the North Pole. No, seriously, Dan, Tom, and Josh, arrested. Ow, 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 get the interspersal already. Yo, that's who it is, Dan, that's who's whooping your ass right now. <laughs> How about them time zones now, jackass? <laughs> <laughs> We at the Fire Pit Podcast preemptively apologize (laughs) for this episode. Oh no, the team is being arrested. This has never happened before. Whatever will they do? Oh no. Sarcastic because this has totally happened before. But if you want to set up some advertisements for your amazing products, or if you want to set up some of your journey ideas, or if you want to set up some conversation points with us in private, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing us whether it's for an ad an idea a movie that you think would be ideal an advertisement on how and how not to proceed with some of our scripted segments and send it our way from there we'll read it frame it for a crime it didn't commit Send it to a maximum security person with the worst criminals imaginable and never respond. Why would we send emails to a maximum security prison when storing them in a folder would be easier? (laughs) Well, you see... But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com Capital C Capital C capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. I'll let you get back to the episode while right here I remain stuck. Thank you all for listening. And as always, good luck. do do ba do boo baby. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. This movie sucks. (laughs) Not even 10 seconds in. I wonder if this music could make it any more obvious that this is made in 1989. Hey, it's Robert Zadaris. He would later star in Samurai Cop. (laughs) Oh, his career's on the up. He's dead now. Oh, okay. Every time they do something that is not something a cop can do, take a drink. You'll be drunk (laughs) by minute 12. Can't do that. Can't get that drunk tonight. Hey, that's the bad guy from Inner Space. Yes. And that's a bad guy from Wings World 2. And that's the bad guy from Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> <laughs> All the 80s classics here. Hi there. There's your gratuitous sex scene. I, hey, I'm, I'm happy now. <laughs> I'm good. I don't know what Tom's issue is with this movie. I mean, so far, it is perfect. I mean, eight minutes in, we've had one shootout, one car chase, and a sex scene.
I'm, okay, I'm I'm starting to uh, I'm starting to wonder what two years ago Tom was seeing wrong with this film. Yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> pre p- pre pandemic, man, we all was, yeah. we all didn't know where our place was you, in the world. You appreciate the little things after the pandemic. If you really want to stare death in the eye, you should have gotten married. Is that a proposal? Seriously, all this dialogue, I just this movie is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad Josh is having fun. Yeah, our Martin Riggs, I mean, Gabriel Cash, His he's not going to have a dead wife. He's just single. Yeah. Yeah. And he's not going to live, he's not going to live in a trailer down by the ocean. He's just going to live in a rundown apartment. Oh my God, it's Gal Dukat. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> Take a drink. We've got a Star Trek. <laughs> Your Honor, may I approach the bench, please? Proceed, Mr. Tango. He's going to dance right up there. Get it? Because Tango's a dance. Stop. Stop. We, we, we got it, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Woo. Of that scene, I got to say, Sly's got the better ass. Your Honor, this is the wrong kind of partial nudity. <laughs> Dude, look at the chin on that guy. Holy shit. Dude, you could do pull ups on his chin. It's like the doctor said, I think you've had enough Botox. He said, I'll tell you when <laughs> I've had enough. Oh, I'm talking about all that filthy scum I have to deal with out there. Well, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love this movie. Hmm. All right. Multiple fetishes are being satisfied in this movie. <laughs> Josh, your mic's on. <laughs> <laughs> a bullet that works as a lock pick. Remember that time I talked about things that make sense in the context of the universe that exists in? Yeah. That's that. Hello, late 80s Terry Hatcher. Again, because this is your second appearance in the film. Oh, she can dance and play the drums. Ooh. She is a woman of many talents, Terry Hatcher. You know, it's a free country, Tango. And what's that mean? People are free to do what they want. So, so your sister is very, very free. Let me shoot. <laughs> I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is the greatest film since Citizen Kane. <laughs> also, who's that guy? He looks familiar. He does look familiar. Well, that's Kurt Russell. He was in the movie we watched last week. The thing. Thanks, Josh. I was really confused for a minute. Oh God! <laughs> um, wait. I I love this movie. I do. I unapologetically adore this film. Okay, dangling over over the ledge of a fifty story building isn't working. Let's strap a grenade in his mouth. This is Plan B. I'd hate to see what C D E F G A. Well, it all involves a grenade, just different holes in the body. <laughs> Oh. Multiple fetishes. <laughs> R slash confused boners. <laughs> you know who I was all along. I figured it out. I've been getting a lot of press lately. But seriously, you could have changed out of the women's clothes like an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> Ultra booster. It's nitrous oxide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a Jeep, that's a shuttlecraft. No, that's a Chevy. <laughs> I love this movie. <laughs> they killed Goldacott. Wait, what? No. No, they didn't. Yeah, now he's dead. Oh, R slash confused boner. Subscribe. Actually, it's no longer confused. <laughs> oh, Catherine, getting that two in the morning phone call, seeing something's happened to you. Best acting ever. It is. I love this movie and stop talking bad about it. <laughs> this movie's now my favorite child. Yes. <laughs> He's holding the razor blade backwards. That's right, because it folds it, the blades inwards, isn't it? Just when it closes. <laughs> this is the dumbest henchman ever. How were they able to drive through downtown or anywhere with a chain gun strapped to the side? And they have rocket launchers. Of course they have rocket launchers. What's amazing is Tango and Cash's vehicle is a better G.I. Joe vehicle than anything that showed up in any of the both G.I. Joe movies. <laughs> Even the villains, like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
this is like in those uh like streets of rage type games from the early 90s yeah where it's like you'd be playing in two-player mode oh then, my like, god bad guy yes. you have to fight the bad guy but the clone the bad guy would show up it'd be exact same with the bad guy so you both had somebody to fight <laughs> yeah that's this scene oh my god oh my god does this have the classic mirrors final scene yes this he- movie is perfect <laughs> He's ten on a- ten on ten. It's never, guys. We got to stop the podcast after this episode. It's never going to get any better than this. <laughs> yeah, we've definitely peaked with this one. From now on, when Tom picks a list, we go with Dan's. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. Bravissimo! Bravissimo! Yes. Oh my God! Death. Mwah! Oh, compliments to the chef. This movie felt like when uh, McDonald's runs those special quarter pounders with cheese. Mm, <laughs> just like, oh, you're going to put what on the top? Oh, my God. Perfect. So filling. So that was um, Tango in Cash. We just finished up watching this bona fide classic. Uh, but and we've all <laughs> we've all got some thoughts on it. I think they might mirror each other a little bit. But uh, let's start things off with Josh. Uh, okay, I gotta say, you know how I was talking about how it was classic '80s, everything's better and all that, and I had really really high expectations for this film. And I uh, just watching this movie, you get the sense of a certain thing going on, and you just you watch it, and then you realize that this was in fact the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> like there there is no equal end game be damned i had more fun on this than when captain america picked up the hammer like seriously why did this movie not pull in a billion dollars in the 80s um like all honesty now that movie was a lot of fun it was corny and cheesy at times it had some of the best slash worst dialogue i have ever heard in film but oh my god it was fun like i said if i came out of this um Enjoying it more than I enjoyed 21 Bridges, it will have been a success. I enjoyed this significantly more than that. I know you guys had thoughts on that, so I won't say too much more about that. But yeah, this movie was awesome. It didn't take itself seriously, and it definitely definitely leaned into the fact that this was trying to be a cop, buddy cop film slash comedy. So there's not much more to say. If you have not seen this movie and you liked movies like Lethal Weapon, Beverly Hills Cop, this movie has all of the tropes. It has all of the cliches and it has all of the great one-liners. Matter of fact, I think that's all it is. I think when they were writing the script for this, they just, they didn't write any dialogue. They just wrote (laughs) one-liners. Like I I made a comment when we were watching the film, I want the Tango and Cash play set because, oh my God, it felt like there should have been toys accompanying the release of this movie. I would have bought them. Seriously. I want my Tango and Cash toys. I don't care. They're 31 years late. Give me my Tango and Cash toys. But yeah, that's, that, that's all I've got. Tom, Tom, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts now. So this is interesting. I've gone from loving this movie to hating this movie to learning to love it again. This was a bad movie, but damned if this was not a fun, bad film. I can kind of see why it didn't do so well during the time it was made, considering you had Lethal Weapon to pair it up against and that was just the cool buddy cop movie um i do love i do love that all the dialogue that we wanted in 21 bridges was here all along (laughs) took us three films to find it yes and they just for two hours that's all it was excuse me an hour and a half it knew how long it needed to be without overstaying its welcome i'm going to Especially call out the music. Harold Faltermeyer did the score for this film, and he was the go to uh, composer for action films, especially in the 80s with Beverly Hills Cops 1 and 2, Running Man, and Top Gun. And he did a great job. This was just pure 1980s synthesizer brilliance. My God. God, I'm going to add and subtract as we go. Nigel, your thoughts. Well, I, I'm with you, Tom. I can see why this film didn't do as well in its time, like why it wasn't as popular as 
Lethal Weapon because if Lethal Weapon is Transformers, this movie is GoBots. <laughs> <laughs> I get that reference. I mean, <laughs> fine toys on their own. They're they're okay. They were they were fine, and they mixed well with Transformers. You know, if you're a kid, you don't really know any better, but they weren't the same thing. They no. weren't the same thing. So. This is the GoBots to Lethal Weapons Transformers. But I do now know why, when I was looking up trivia, why it took four directors and three producers and a handful of executives to edit this film and get it. No one man could contain this much awesome and harness it <laughs> and harness it properly. Okay. Speak it. Yeah. Amen, brother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, no one person could harness this much. There was no Infinity Gauntlet back then to contain all the Infinity Stones, you know? Now, we've we've watched some really good movies over the last few months, not taking anything away from the good ones we've watched. But I haven't had this much fun watching a film with you guys since Days of Thunder. Yes. And like, yes. yes. Where it was just nonstop from the opening credits to the end credits of just like, oh my God, this is awesome. Like, this is great. Even though, like, yes, Tom, you're right. It's a bad film. Like, it's not a good film. It's not, you know, um, it's not a great movie. And like I said, it's a it's a buddy cop film. It kind of paint by numbers. Buddy cop doesn't really do anything outside of the genre, the comfort zone of it. But man, was this movie fun. This movie was fun. It's a just a little over an hour and a half, but it doesn't really feel like it. It moves really quick. Um, mm-hmm. It goes from beat to beat to beat. And yes, it's full of a lot of unrealistic 80s action stuff, you know, but who cares? Who cares? It works in the context of the universe, and I don't care. So it was awesome. And honestly, watching his performance in this movie, if Kurt Russell hadn't turned down Lethal Weapon to go make Big Trouble in Little China, I think Lethal Weapon still would have been just as popular, just as good of a film. Mm -hmm. I I agree. If he'd have been Martin Riggs instead of Mel Gibson, not taking anything away from Mel Gibson because he's awesome in that film, and we'll talk about it if we ever get to it. But uh, if Kurt Russell had been Martin Riggs instead of Mel Gibson, uh, I still think Lethal Weapon would have been a huge franchise. I still think there'd be three or four of the movies. And I still think it would be just as fondly remembered today because he was basically Martin Riggs in this film. Like he was just a different version of him. Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, OK, go another Transformers to GoBots reference. If if Mel Gibson's Martin Riggs is uh, Optimus Prime, then uh Kurt Russell's cash is leader one. Like I said, it was fine. He was really good in this film. Um, I really liked K- Kurt Russell. I thought Kurt Russell and Sylvester Stallone had great chemistry oh, together. They did. So good. Oh my God. So much sexual tension between the two of them. Yeah. Uh, just they were, they had really good chemistry, but I mean, I've said my solo thoughts and I just think the three of us are just discussing this film now. And I think we should really get into this. Cause this is just, a, this was just a fun movie to watch. It was so, so yes. much fun to watch. I have to comment. The one thing that I was thinking as you guys were given your final thoughts is like the entire plot of this movie is basically the plot two friends come up with when they're downstairs playing with their G.I. Joes. Oh, oh my, my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> my character's like this rich, beefy guy. He's got awesome suits and a really cool gun, but it's like that really tiny gun and such. And it's really cool. It's like, well, my guy's got laser sights and he's got bulletproof vests. Oh, and then and then they got framed for something because they were too good. They were too good of cops. I my my one one regret is that we can't like redo our cold open skits and whatnot to make it that. Because <laughs> seriously, this movie was awesome. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my god, yes. Personally, though, I mean, it's only an hour and a half long, but I think they could have probably shaved a good 15 minutes down. Yeah, um, I, maybe the, it did kind of bog down a little bit in the courtroom stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. That, that, the, 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 from the courtroom to the uh, jailbreak. Yeah, yeah. And the, the whole like underground scene where they're getting electrocuted, they they didn't really need that considering nothing really happened from that. They could have had the warden come and was like, don't worry, I'll get you guys out. And then they could have had that whole fake escape or whatever. But yeah, but oh, yeah, the movie's definitely got its flaws. But to put more parallels with 21 Bridges, that movie took itself too seriously. This movie did not. Like, Dan, what was it you were saying when he pulled out the bullet and turned that into a lockpick? It made sense in the context of that universe. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I said. Like, like there's certain movies that were like when you're watching it, like, yeah, if it was a different genre or a different type of movie. Like, okay, like if, if Chadwick Boseman had taken a bullet and used it as a lockpick in 21 Bridges, it would have been, well, 
even more stupid than anything else in that film. But it wouldn't have made sense in the context of that universe. However, this one, why not? Boot gun within the first five minutes of the film. So, of course, a bullet can be a lockpick, too. Like, it, may, you know. Now, if the movie had been serious and then all of a sudden he uses a bullet as a lockpick, you're like, that's out of nowhere. So, yeah. yeah. Now, that would have been like, because... 21 Bridges took itself very seriously. So if, like you said, Chadwick Boseman did that about three quarters of the way into the movie, you'd have been like, okay, where's this coming from? Right, yeah. Like I said, it just didn't work in the context of that universe. But here it does. Like I said, I mean, the first two minutes of the film, it was boot gun. Yeah. Yeah. It's like right there. It's like, we know what to expect out of this film. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boot gun. So obviously, you know, 45 minutes after I see boot gun, I see lockpick bullet. I'm like, okay. Like, yeah, I don't even blink like about it, you know. An RV with a chain gun mounted to the side of it? Yeah, sure, yeah. why not? Yeah, I mean, it looks like fucking something out of Mask, but, you know, another 80s toy reference, yeah. you know. Um, so, whatever, but, I mean, it made sense in the context of the universe, and that's probably what makes the movie so fun, it, that they just didn't take itself seriously. So, I wonder if that was part of the problem. Maybe the other cuts of the film were maybe a little more serious, like made the film a little bit more of a serious movie. And the the guys were like, this isn't going to work. You guys need to cut this and make it a little more lighthearted. I don't know. That, well, obviously it still didn't work. Still, I, I don't know. This movie was fun. I really enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Days of Thunder for buddy cop films. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I was expecting this to be the low point on, the, uh, on this journey. Yeah. But no, dude, I really enjoyed watching this movie. I definitely will be picking this up again. Yeah, this is definitely one I'll, I'll watch again and enjoy it. And it'll go right into my regular rotation of, of guilty pleasure movies. So, yes. Yes, this is one of those rare occasions. In fact, I think this is one of the only occasions where a movie I've hated or not liked so much, I've come back around on and I see the joy in it. Yeah. Oh, my God. Can we all agree um, Sylvester Stallone's character was gay? He was definitely gay. Yeah, he was He was gay. Yes. I, I noticed that in the second time I watched it, first time as an adult. Like, he has that tiny snub-nosed gun early on, but as soon as he meets Kurt Russell's character, his gun gets bigger. He gets that <laughs> bigger gun. He starts and he's literally trying to propose to every guy who talks to him. He has a sister. And he lives with her. Yes. Oh, and then he called his uh, cellmate his fiance too. Mm -hmm. it's like and it was late 80s so they that's what they could get away with without pissing anyone off so i wonder what they would do for the sequel i really hope they make a sequel oh my god they need to make a sequel sly if you listen to this podcast you have our blessing to make a sequel i know that has no weight whatsoever we hold no authority anywhere whatsoever but please god make a sequel we're on our knees for you sly (laughs) at least tango Yes. Please make a sequel to this film. This was the greatest film ever. Yes, we need a Tango and Cash too. Yeah. Yes. America needs a Tango and Cash sequel. Please. It would be called Tango and Cash. Let's dance. Yes, 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 yes. Please, yes. And bring back Terry Hatcher. Oh, you've got to have Terry Hatcher. Yeah. Like I said, this is a this was a fun film. Like I said, it's it's definitely go bots to to Lethal Weapons Transformers, but Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you say that like GoBots is the lesser, but those was actually made with metal. But uh, okay, Josh. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> he's not wrong. <laughs> okay, when you really, really, really wanted Megatron for Christmas, and you open up Psykill, <laughs> I mean, you're you're happy you got a new toy, but you're still kind of like, screw you, Santa. What I can't hell? take this. Yeah, I can't take this to the playground. Yeah. You don't beat me up. Yeah. So, like I said, it's it's all right. Um, but it, like, I, I'm not saying it wasn't bad. This was a great. Yeah. This was fun. This was a really fun movie. Not a great film. It's not a good movie, but fun movie. Fun yeah. movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Definitely one of those movies where it's like, all right, guys, we're getting together tonight. We're playing the Tango and Cash drinking game. Here's your uh, list of stuff to drink on. Yeah. And everybody's hammered by about 20 minutes in. <laughs> they keep breaking the law while enforcing the law. <laughs> Dirty Harry isn't this loose cannon. <laughs> I'm dead. I've hit all my thoughts. I... Yeah, yeah, me too. I don't think there's much more. We could go on for a while longer, but... Oh uh... my God. I mean, there's, yeah, there's not much to dissect about this film. Like, it didn't, it didn't break any ground in camera work or... Or uh, uh, cinematography or, or 
acting or anything like me, well, well, the music was good i thought the, the, music, the soundtrack yeah, the music was, was awesome good. i'm not saying it was but i mean like if we compare and contrast it to last week's movie like obviously i would say that the thing is better yeah um, you mm-hmm. know, note for note the thing is better but i had more fun watching this movie <laughs> yeah in in terms of cheeseburgers this was a five guys burger this had all the toppings mm. yeah yeah <sighs> So I guess with the conclusion of these amazing final thoughts, that's tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes, Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe on whatever platform you choose to listen to us on. We really appreciate it. It helps us out. Give us a rating. Um, If you do, we come up on searches for, well, if somebody was searching Tango in Cash, it might link our podcast and, you know, because we talk about this film tonight. So just leave us a review. It really helps us out, helps the channel grow. And also be sure to join us on our Discord channel channel the link can be found in the episode's description but you can find us at discord.me slash fire pit there you'll get notifications of new episodes and even better you can engage in discussions with other fans of the show about which was better go bots or transformers tango and cash or lethal weapon so hop on in it is a fun time and if you want to leave us just a nice private message just that we will read and uh you don't want to post that to an open forum you can email us at curtain call entertainment inc at gmail.com feel free to send us any kind of a message you want preferably a, a good happy one because we we don't take kindly and our egos are very fragile and frail and we will shatter to a thousand pieces if you send us a bad message but please We look forward to hearing from you. If email isn't your thing, go ahead and follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both are linked in the episode's description. Cool. And I would like to shout out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Uh, Thanks very much for your continued support listening. I'd also like to shout out Zencaster. Our editor, Tom, was talking about how Zencaster saved his bacon again while he was editing and downloading audio from uh, the last episode we recorded. So thank you, Zencaster for continuing to make it so that we don't have to A, re-record stuff, or B, just lose it forever. Yes, and for my end, as an editor, I would like to shout out Audacity. Audacity is a free editing program. It allows me to make sure our voice sounds the voiciest, our scripted segments and skits are smooth with all the special effects that effects can special. Audio that just rings in your ear. They are free. I'm not paying for them, and they're not paying me to say anything good about them. But if you want to do your own podcast, feel free to give it a go. Trust me, it really is a fantastic bit of software. And speaking of fantastic, I'd like to shout out as well one of our Facebook followers, Devonte. Devonte is one of the many hundreds of individuals who follow us on our Facebook page, whether they listen to the show regularly, pop in every so often, or just come to the page just to see what's going on and give us a thumbs up whenever. Devante, thank you for joining us and keeping those fire pits burning. And uh, I would like to shout out Sync Lounge and Plex for hosting our viewing evenings. They do a great job with minimal interruptions and minimal technical difficulties. Granted, I host the hardware, but the software is uh, bar none. Yes, shout out to both Sync Lounge and Plex, both free software, so you should give it a try. But more importantly, a special shout out to my wonderful, beautiful wife, who um, allows me to do this thing and doesn't hate on it too much. I absolutely love her and adore her, and she's standing right next to me. So that's it for (laughs) I've Got Tonight. Beautiful. We're not a visual. We're not a visual medium, but Josh is blinking SOS in Morse code. (laughs) I'm glad she can hear that. (laughs) <laughs> so it sounds like we need to call a cop, Dan. Are, are there any cops coming up on the next movie? Well, it's funny you should mention that because our next film, we're going to watch... Nithox. <laughs> or we could watch Lando Calrissian and uh, Rocky uh, find a terrorist. So In Nithox. I mean, look, that's how it's pronounced, right? N-I-T-H-A-W-K-S. Nithox. No, Josh. <laughs> Did I misread that? Yes. We're watching Nighthawks next week, everybody. Good night. I've been Dan. I've been Tom. And I've been Josh. Thanks for listening. 
This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. Man, Dan, that was awesome. I cannot believe how cool that was. You totally broke us out of jail. Yeah, I was, I'm not going to lie, Nigel. I was totally pissed at you for just ditching us. But man, did you ever come through? And then that wall exploded inward and you came flying in with that Huey. Oh, yeah. my God. Mm-hmm. Dan. Yeah, told us to run upstairs and get on top of the building yep. while flying a helicopter, mind you. God, that was yep. epic. Upside down. Nigel, how did you get so good? I've played a lot of Battlefield 4. Defying physics. Man, and that, that confrontation on the rooftop with the warden, oof, he was pissed. When his uh, lieutenant came out, you know, Von Strongman with those two giant weights for freaking hammers. I thought you were done for. Josh, well, you came out of nowhere and just... Yeah, I grabbed you by the cuff of your thing. I pulled you off the side of the, uh, the building. And, like, you had no idea. You thought I was just killing us willy-nilly. But nope, nope. We fell for a little bit, and then guess who caught us? Me. Yeah. What was it that you said? That what was that really cool catchphrase that you said? That's right. Looks like we're all got early parole, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, Dan nailed it with that one. And then you're like, convict you later. I don't know. That was dumb, Tom. Well, well it was kind of funny how everybody just kind of went silent and just looked at you dumb for a second. Well, in my defense, I was basically falling. Then the wardens were down there and the guns were firing. Everyone was shooting. And I was losing my grip and I couldn't hold on to the railing any further. And just when I was about to lose my grip, Josh, when you just reached down and grabbed my wrist. And then at that moment, the prison just exploded. Boom. And none of us looked down because we all had our sunglasses on. Cool guys don't look at explosions. Exactly. And I'm just going to say this. It sucks to not be anyone in the state of California because everyone saw that. And if you didn't see it, you missed out. It was epic. I really outdid myself on this breakout. Yeah. Yes. But now um, I've got to ask, guys, why are we in the middle of nowhere with this piece of shit car? I blew our budget on those explosions. Oh, OK. Plus, you guys did crash a helicopter when you were arguing who gets shotgun. Makes sense. Why can't we just fly? Well, there is that no fly list. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're a three time escapees from prison, getting on an airplane is kind of a little troublesome. But that's all right. I mean, how long can it take to drive from L.A. to New York anyways? Nine days. Shotgun. Shotgun. Shit.